All right, let's go. Okay, so, uh, so uh, welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, our first of many, hopefully, developmental rounds. Um, so we have it every second Wednesday of the month, except for this month. Uh, so let's see, second Wednesday, or the third. Yeah. Second. It's the third. No, second. Second. Okay, so second Wednesday of every month. Um, and we'll sort of alternate between research and, and sort of more clinical presentations. Um, and uh, if what we'll try and do, because we are using technology, hopefully, uh, is we'll save questions till the end unless there's some really pressing thing in, in between. Um, so our first speaker, uh, the inaugural speaker, uh, is, uh, is uh, Dr. Julio Martinez. Um, so Julio is, uh, I, I, I guess I should also give credit to, to Dr. Mitchell, it's perfect timing. Uh, so it's actually, all of this was really Claire's idea, so uh, kudos, kudos to Dr. Mitchell, there you go. You can put that on your acuity star thing for next time. So, so Julio is a professor in the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology, and is also the uh, endowed chair in autism research at Western, uh, and comes to us from McGill, and is today is gonna talk about uh, the effects of methylphenidate and how it really works. Right? Good. That's right. Well, um, thanks Rob for, uh, for the introduction, and I also wanted to say that I brought a pie, shall I wear it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I just want to give you one okay, but that, that's okay. So, uh, uh, well, thank you very much uh, for that. I just want to say that um, uh, one of the things that I have been trying to do uh, during the last year, so the last two years, is to drive my research a little bit more into the clinical direction so that it has some meaning, so that we actually find some problems that actually really apply to, to clinic. And I have been about probably around 20 years now studying attention. And I just um, wanted to give you um, a little, I mean, one of the big challenges that we have is to figure out how brain function actually is uh, uh, arises as a function of the activity of neurons in the brain. So many neurobiologists who believe that activity of neurons is what produces behavior, what produces thought, what produces complex function. Of course, some of them are more complex, but um, we try to figure out how this happens. Now, I'm going to show you um, a video. It's kind of a challenge. It's almost like an IQ test. So please pay attention, and you're going to tell me is uh, what part of the image is changing, okay? There's gonna be one image, there's gonna be a blank screen, that another image changing, another image, another image, which is the same image, but there is something changing. So if you find what is changing, please raise your hand. No. Uh, look at the building. Look at the building. The building is over. Okay? So no one passes it. I think you kind of raise your hand, right? You're, did you see it? Did you see it? Okay, well, one person out of that. This is statistics. It's a classical chain blind part. Right? Now you will see this one. Let's do another thing. What is changing? The dog. Okay, yeah. So that was easily. And one of the reasons why you're so good at, at actually at, at looking at this is because the dog is at the center of the image. And because it's, the dog is something that you cannot help but to pay attention to. So my point is, even if those images are getting into your retina, so you don't see what is out there in your, in your retina. You only see what you're attending to. And of course, many of your clinicians, uh, as you know, deficits of attention actually play many brain disorders, actually are present in ADHD, autism, schizophrenia. Just mention it. So uh, some people just complain of brain clutter, et cetera, et cetera. There is even a, a movie that uh, my wife showed me about, uh, it was a person of that uh, has autism and going to Walmart and trying to see how the whole, it is on, on YouTube, I don't know if you have seen that movie. And it's just uh, trying to say how the whole uh, scene actually, and everything starts changing. And at the, at the beginning, she's kind of focusing something, but then things are just kind of start coming um, in the visual field, and the movie is quite impressive. But uh, importantly, methylphenidate is one of the most widely used to treat uh, disorders of attention. Many of you know that. So actually, there are about 3.5 million kids in the US on methylphenidate. 
probably not. Uh, what I want to talk today is about methylphenidate, and uh, we have been trying to do uh, some research on methylphenidate and to see how it improves attention. Okay, methylphenidate was first uh, synthesized in 1944 by Panizon and Siva, and now it's Novartis. Um, and they call it Ritalin after uh, his wife. So, because she wanted to play tennis and to increase the heart rate and to get more energy to play tennis, so she started taking the Ritalin. And that's how they call it Ritalin. So it was, it was licensed in the U.S. in 1955, and has been increasingly prescribed for uh, after the diagnosis of ADHD actually became uh, um, uh, legal or, or established, uh, widely accepted. And this is about the percentage of children probably in the U.S. alone that take methylphenidate. I don't have the statistics for Canada, which is kind of embarrassing, kind of embarrassing, because I gave this talk in, in the U.S. the last time. So, um, well. What I found about the methylphenidate was there is this clinical trial that they did in 2015, and the result of this meta-analysis, I'm sorry, meta-analysis, was that the methylphenidate seemed to improve, actually, a cognitive uh, function uh, in healthy adults. And there are, of course, a lot of literature also in children with ADHD and other things. So, um, which is kind of uh, interesting because you can actually think about a cognitive enhancer. And I had some questions about um, how is this series about this guy that thinks that they feel like it's a cognitive enhancer, mm -hmm. how is that called? It's a movie. I don't know. But where it, can, it could be classified as a cognitive enhancer. And I have to confess to you that when I was in med school, one day I have a, an anatomy exam mm -hmm. and I spent my weekend on methylphenidate. So I took the exam on Monday. Internet, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay. <laughs> well, on Monday, I did pass the exam. I did very good in the exam. On Tuesday, I crashed. So that wasn't good. So it's not good. So, uh, uh, well, you know, that was it was in Cuba. So then, then it's okay. <laughs> no legal problems, you know. It's okay. So, <laughs> unless the castor is listening. It's all for that. So, uh, now, what does methylphenidate do? A lot of people have done uh, research on methylphenidate in the neurochemical actions of methylphenidate. And we know that the synapse, for example, we know that uh, in synapses, in many synapses, prefrontal cortex, there are neurons that they produce dopamine and noradrenaline. So um, uh, that they release dopamine and noradrenaline. And actually what happens is that this dopamine just gets released into the synaptic cleft, and then there is a transport that actually produces a real take or takes back the, the dopamine or the noradrenaline. And basically, um, what methylphenidate uh, biochemical uh, does at the level of the synapses is block blocking this uh, uh, transport. So there is no real take of methylphenidate, therefore of uh, dopamine and adrenaline, therefore there is more uh, availability in the synapses, and you can have a higher concentration of, and the effects of it. Now, um, how this affects, the, the, the critical question here is how this affects translating to improvements in cognitive performance. And I'd like to, to present you an idea that I have been elaborating for quite a bit, which is the brain soup. So uh, the, in a lot of uh, scenarios, for many companies have been trying to find drugs actually to treat uh, mental disease. And I have the impression that we have been treating the brain like a soup, where the brain has a little bit of this neurochemical, so we put a little bit more of it. Uh, uh, and then glutamate or serotonin or things like that, and that is going to solve the problem. The problem is that the brain is not one soup. The brain is many soups. So the motor system is a soup. The visual system is a soup. Maybe emotional, uh, uh, emotion has its own circuit. And the problem is that all these circuits, actually, they're probably built up by the same genes, and they also are supported or they function with the same neurotransmitter. So, for example, many of you know, if you give a patient with a, a schizophrenia, if you start giving antipsychotics, some of them, they have extra effects. Because you fix the soup, probably, of uh, somewhere in the prefrontal cortex, apparently, but then the extra system that was also working with dopamine and with other neurotransmitters gets affected. So, and this is a big challenge. So, it's not that easy. Um, I have this little scheme in my mind that the brain is made of Genes actually make molecules, molecules make neurons, these neurons organize themselves in networks, and from these networks, behavior happens. And now that would be great if we could make a connection between genes and behavior. 
but I think that it's not that easy. There is a lot of things in the middle, including different kinds of networks, different kinds of molecules. And also we know that there is like alternative splicing, a lot of things with the DNA. So the fact that you have the gene doesn't mean that you're gonna have um, um, certain personality, or it's not deterministic, that's what I say. So it's very hard in all these, uh, um, with all these factors to figure out what a drug does and where does it do it. And to complete, to, to make things more complicated, all these, all these things fit back into the genes. So we know that molecules could influence gene expression, networks, neurons, even behavior could do that. Well, there is a lot of genetic studies out there now. Um, I know that uh, this is uh, quite pessimistic in terms of uh, are we going to understand mental disease in general, um, but I think that we could have a good start if we start looking at single elements of these things. And one of the things that my lab is concentrated in is in circuits. Why I am concentrated in circuits before, before I get into that? Um, is the, because the way that we are working in my lab is to look at behavior and circuits. So circuits is what generates behavior, actually. If we can kind of find the deficits that we, that in, the, in the different circuits, we may be able to actually connect it to behavior and from there, maybe we can reverse engineer some of the components of the disease. Um, now, the first thing that I'm going to talk will be the, pre the primary prefrontal cortical landscape. Then I'm going to talk about information processing in neural networks, noise in single neurons and neural networks, and the effect of methylphenidate, uh, one experiment that we did in the lab with very interesting results. So, First of all, um, this is a, a, a view of, actually, this is a view of a macaque brain, a macaque monkey brain. It's not a human brain, but it's very similar. In the, in, in, so information comes from, let's say, area V1. This is the back part of the brain. When visual information travels, it goes into area V1, and it gets split into two main pathways, what we call the dorsal pathway. This pathway contains information about a spatial position, um, uh, velocity of objects, and there is the ventral pathway. The ventral pathway contains information about identity of objects. They have neurons that are selected for faces, actually for positions, for different complex things. And this information travels to the prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex in the macaque monkey is very similar to the prefrontal cortex in the human, um, since it has actually very similar areas. So all these homologs are in the human prefrontal cortex. What I'm showing you is work of, uh, work of Michael Petridis at McGill, and actually he has characterized a lot of these areas and they have different cytoarchitectonic features. So some of them, they have uh, um, certain type of neurons, and, but something that is common to all of these areas is the connections with the thalamus, and also that they have something that is called a granular layer. So a granular layer is in the cortex you have in layer four, in layer four you have these granules that they look like, a, um, and that's what is called granular layer because if there is abundance of these uh, uh, certain kind of nerves. So now the current theory of how attention is implemented, and we have been working um, for years on that, um, is that areas of the prefrontal cortex, when they grab all this information, they have the saliency map of what is in the environment. And then neurons in this saliency map, driven by different factors, establish competitions between them, between group of neurons representing different things. For example, if I could attend to the door or to the, or, or to the clock, there are a group of neurons representing the clock or the door, and these neurons through lateral connections, so they are competing. And whoever wins, wins my focus of attention. And actually, that's what I'm going to attend, let's say, to the clock in this case. And um, we have been working for years in that, and it seems to be that this prefrontal area, AA, has a lot to do with that. This area 46 has a lot to do with working memory signals, maintenance of information in the absence of sensory input. But um, it is important for now just to consider that uh, this area seems to contain this saliency map of what is out there, what is out there in the environment. And when I have a winner in the saliency map, that's where my attention goes and how the neural activity actually stabilizes in those maps also tells me how good can I maintain or sustain attention on uh, one uh, stimulus or location, which you know that children with ADHD they have problems actually sustaining attention. Um, now, how 
these operations happen in the map. In the map. So first of all, I just want to uh, tell you one of the techniques that we use, what is based on, and how, what kind of neurons can you find there. Um, in the prefrontal cortex, you can find of neurons that are selected for a stimulus locations or even for features. What does it mean selected? So we position an electrode close to a neuron. This is in the, in the, in the alive animal. When we position the electrode, we put the electrode in, the electrode doesn't hurt. So when we, because the brain doesn't have pain fibers so inside, so it's basically the dura. So we can go with a very thin electrode, 75 micrometers, and position it close to a neuron. And we can listen the action potentials of the neuron, how the neuron is responding uh, um, to a given stimulus. Suppose that now at this position, you see uh, uh, on, the, on the screen there, I show this bar oriented horizontally. And then I show another bar oriented, let's say, tilted vertically, tilted the other way. And if I record the number of action potentials that the neuron is firing, every time that I show a different bar, I find that this neuron actually fires the most when the bar is vertical. So this is what we call it a stimulus selected neuron. And you find neurons in the brain selected for this. There are neurons selected for spatial locations when, for example, a subject is attending up and to the right. There are certain neurons that are active only when the subject is attending up and to the right. And that's how the brains, we believe, encodes information. So single neurons get that input and encode the information and tells you, if I'm only listening to, let's say, five or six neurons, each one selected for each one of them, by knowing which neuron is actually firing, I know what, which, which stimulus I am presenting. So that's the way that uh, the information is encoded. Now, um, one of the, of, the, of the problems that we have found that was very nice, and there is people even that found Marilyn Monroe neurons in inferior temporal cortex, and Ronald Reagan neurons. Uh, for sure, Trump neurons, I don't want to find them. But some people may. So, but, so, but for sure, you're going to find any kind of neurons actually that are selected for that specific kind of stimulus. So, but there is a problem that if we listen to the neuron every time they say that I show the stimulus in this this stimulus, um, and I show it the first time and I'm listening to the neuron, the neuron gives me a response. Let's say I'm going to count the spikes per second, which is action potential per second of hundred action potential per second. <coughs> But if, you're so, if I show it a second time, the neuron doesn't give me 100 reaction potential per second. It gives me actually somehow a Gaussian distribution according to what I show, well, the times that I show. I mean, if I show like 100 times the same stimulus, the neuron is going to give me around, let's say here, 100 action potential per second. But some trials is going to give me 80, some trials is going to be, give me 110, 120. And the question that you have to ask, if the neuron responds differently in every trial, how is that I always perceive the same thing? So I should be perceiving different things if the neuron is res responds in a different way. So, which is a puzzling question for many of us, and, but what that tells us is definitely that studying single neurons, we're not gonna understand the brain. So we need to go to study how neurons behave as a general. If you're a statistician, you're gonna tell me that's trivial. All what we need to do is basically um, pull across neurons. That's the solution. It's a statistic 101. Because if I'm listening to, let's say, well, this is the, the this is just the consequences of what uh, a big variable spike rate does. So if it is the same as stimulus and there were 50 spikes, same as stimulus, 75 spikes, this neuron gets pretty confused. They say, what are you encoding really? Because the neuron that is in the prefrontal cortex that doesn't see any of the things. That information has traveled from the retina to the occipital lobe, and all that the neuron has is really the inputs. And you're confusing the neuron because you have 75 inputs in the next trial and so on. Of course, the statistical a statistician would say, all what you need to do is just pull over many neurons. So if you ask people in a room to shout every time, uh, if you shout, for example, with a certain voice this time, and I do, you shout the second time, everyone in the room, I may hear exactly the same thing. But probably all these voices that you have, they have a little slightly different uh, tone, right? 
But in general, it's about the same thing because it cancels out. The noise cancels out. The person, one person was a bit louder and the other person was a little bit lower, I mean, like the, the volume. And by the, in the other trial, they did the opposite. And because they're completely independent, it's like in a statistic, this independent sample, pooling will always result in the mean, right? So that's a very good uh, scenario. And for example, this is the statistic demonstration of that. So this is the, the, when we show the stimulus, how the neuron responds, and what you have here, oh, on this side of the distribution, on this side of the distribution, so 50 spikes per second, next time, because there are hundreds and millions of neurons, they're going to fire, at the end, we're going to get exactly the 50 spikes per second to the, to the neuron um, uh, that is actually downstream. Let me see if I can show it here. Exactly that, yeah. This is exactly, and this is a happy neuron downstream because you get exactly the same number of spikes or the same number of inputs. So if I have a rate code, and my rate means that when I fire 100 spikes per second, this is a vertical bar, and when I fire zero spikes per second, it's an horizontal bar, the code is unambiguous. That was very nice while people were doing single unit recording, but it was a problem. And the problem is that the brain actually is connected in a pretty wild manner. So it has a lot of inputs sharing a lot of inputs, but neurons also share lateral connections. So if this neuron inputs to these three neurons and these three neurons to the other neuron, and these neurons connect among them, they will mutually excite each other. And then you have a statistic problem here. You will have a common input, lateral connections, and then the statistic problem that we have is the following. When neuron one fires at this, in this part of the distribution, neuron two will do the, probably the same thing because they're sharing common inputs. And they're getting exactly the same inputs from, so our statistic independence assumption went away. So and here you have, again, the same problem, 20 spikes per second to the downstream reader, 70 and 30. So it's, the downstream reader is confused again. And what we know from anatomy is that uh, in the brain, actually, neurons do share lateral connections. In fact, when you saw the first picture that I show you, uh, there is a lot of interneurons and, and pyramidal neurons, and they actually share connectivity, and they have common input. So this is a problem. How the brain then solves the problem that with noisy neural activity, we have a stable perception. And we can actually uh, reliably attend to the same position every day or find our route to a certain position, even if the neurons are not seen. So um, I'm going to further illustrate this problem because the brain doesn't work with one neuron, it works with many neurons. I will just generalize this problem to um, of try to formalize this problem statistically. So suppose that this is neuron one and this is neuron two, and we were showing, uh, for example, two stimuli oriented horizontally and vertical, let's say. Each stimulus, every time that I present the stimulus, so the neurons are going to give me a firing rate, let's say for a stimulus one, and this is going to be a distribution if we plot one neuron in the other. And this is going to be a distribution for a stimulus two. Now, suppose that my job is to actually dissociate between two things, so to distinguish, to distinguish between a stimulus number one and a stimulus number two, or emotional state number one and emotional state number two, or percept number one and percept number two, it is a problem that these neurons, the firing is correlated possibly. Why it is a problem? Because if I ask a neuron downstream that would act actually as a reader, all what the neuron receives is uh, uh, inputs from these two neurons to classify between these two uh, actually states, state one and state two, there is a huge overlapping in the amount, in the responses of these two neurons to one state or the other. So this overlapping, if I would train a classifier, a classifier is just a, a statistical way to do it. Um, well, we use actually something that is called machine learning. Machine learning is nothing else that you train actually a neural an artificial neural network or an artificial system to classify between two states. And to classify between two states, you need to have, the first thing that you need to have is a nice separation between the states to train the system. It doesn't have it here, so because they are correlated. Now, what would be an easy way to solve this problem? Would be actually decorrelating the neural activity. If we decorrelate these two neurons, so we may actually the firing uh, completely, then fire completely independent, then we solve the statistical problem, our boundaries, which is pretty much 
uh, it's pretty much clean. And here there is a huge overlap, and you're, you're going to get a lot of false positives and, and errors in, in the classification. Um, now, this is what we call actually noise correlation. Noise correlations is when the two neurons fire all together and they produce this noise that doesn't let the brain actually to have a stable amount of signal every time that you present the stimulus. And noise correlations is something that we believe, and we have the hypothesis that might be candidate to be doing something to noise correlation in the brain. So making the brain to fire in a less noisy manner. That was our, our working hypothesis. And by the way, by the way, the way that methylphenidate could be doing this is by actually maybe acting on these lateral connections. So basically making the neurons more independent from each other. So maybe for other things the neurons want to be wired, but for these things specifically like sustaining attention or shifting attention, that is what we were looking at, uh, the, the, the neurons want to be independent. So what we did basically was to run a clinical trial in non-human primates. So non-human primates are animals that you can train in front of the screen to do different tasks. And I'm going to show you uh, some of the tasks that you can do in non-human primates. Uh, these animals actually, they have a prefrontal cortex that is similar to humans. So you could, uh, you could actually extrapolate the results from uh, the prefrontal cortex of humans. Actually, I was uh, looking at the anatomy um, on brain simulation, deep brain simulation that we were uh, looking into some projects that we have in the lab. And uh, deep brain simulation of the fornix in, in macaques and actually in humans, they seem to have very similar effects in Parkinson's disease too. So it is a very good model to look at into this kind of question, particularly prefrontal cortex. I should say that the prefrontal cortex in primates has developed a lot. So and acquire all this lateral prefrontal cortex area where we find areas that are actually uh, uh, selected for reward, for the allocation of attention, for working memory, so it's extraordinarily complex, and we still don't understand very much what these areas in the prefrontal cortex do. But we know that when we have a lobotomy, a patient with a lobotomy probably is deeply affected. So a lot of high-level cognitive functions, human personality, and things like that. So we, look, we use these small microelectrodes arrays. These are very small arrays by four by four millimeters that people have been using in neural prosthetics now. I don't know if you have uh, watched the trials for neural prosthetics, so there is a uh, uh, groups of uh, people with the spinal cord uh, section that they're trying to put these electrodes to extract neural activity. So we use it in this case uh, and to drive a robot so that the person could drink a beer or things like that. that was there. But in this case, we actually use it to extract neural activity. And this is how it looks like. Oh, hold on. Actually, this would be the size of the, of the, of the electrode. This could be getting close to a neuron. And this is a hair. Actually, this was made by a German artist by hand. Do you believe that? I mean, I, that's his name there. It was uh, Stefan Troyer from the German Prince. was polite enough to let him use it. But this man actually, he retired. He said that he wanted to retire and paint. But it was, it was amazing. And this is the kind of activity that you can find in single neurons. So the kind of activity that you record, for example, this is action potential from two neurons. That one looks more like an interneuron, an inhibitory neuron. And this one looks more like a, because the duration of the action potential like a pyramidal cell. Pyramidal cells are the ones that are projecting outputs to other parts of the brain. This is how it uh, works in the recordings. It's not that important. This. Now, the first question that we asked here was, if we are really measuring activity in the areas that actually uh, uh, drive attention, uh, we should be able to decode the allocation of attention from the animal's neural activity. I don't like to say this word, but I will say it because it might wake you up. It's about like mind reading, almost like mind reading. If I take the electrical activity from the brain of the animal, right, can I actually guess where the animal was attending to? If I take the neural activity from the, from the brain of a patient, can I know if the patient was paying attention to the right, to the left? And let me say something that is not obvious because we're talking about covert attention. Of course, all of you are psychologists, psychiatrists, I mean, you know what covert attention is. I just want to recap. Overattention is when you attend to what is in your phobia. Covert attention is when you attend to things that you're not looking at. And we primates, we're very good at doing that. I have a little anecdote of one of the animals. Actually, I go into the cage with one of the monkeys, and what the monkey does is uh, I just throw a piece of apple, and of course, the dominant male doesn't let anyone to eat, so he goes and he grabs a piece of apple. 
And then the second time, I just looked at the dominant male and I say, well, I'm going to do uh, throw the piece of apple in a way that the dominant male doesn't see it, but the one that I wanted to grab the apple was it a little monkey, so we'll see it. So I throw the, the, and you know, the little monkey doesn't look straight at the apple. The apple is on the floor and he's like, ah. as soon as the dominant male turns around, he goes and grabs it. So basically he was using cover attention. So these animals use cover attention very, and you know, it strikes me. I have, um, I have a daughter that has autism actually, and I think that she's using cover attention a lot. I think she's using cover attention a lot because I am giving her the food and she doesn't want to look at me. As soon as I go away, she just fixate on my class. And she knows exactly, she does that with the milk. So it's looking there and she just knows exactly where the milk is. So I think that she uses cover attention a lot for that. Rob knows no more about that than me, so I don't know that. I'm I just, you know more than your daughter. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but it's an impression that I have that they're using this cover attention a lot just to avoid getting stuck. That's an impression that I have. But no, I just dropped it there. So we train the monkeys in the following task. This is a very easy task. You present on a computer screen, the monkey is sitting now on a computer screen, you present actually uh, this stimulus that is called a grading. We use it because it's a very a stimulus using vision a lot. And we can characterize a lot of things about this stimulus. And this is the cue. Then we present four, three other ones after a certain delay. And what the animal has to do is when the target, which is that one that was at the cue position, changes orientation, he has to make a cut toward that stimulus. If any of the other stimuli change orientation, he has to withhold it. If nothing changes orientation, he cannot make an eye movement. And we're measuring eye movement. So we know exactly where, where the eyes are going. So we call, it, we call it a cover attention task because this is the cue. Gaze is fixating always on the cross. This is the cue. And these are distractors, and that would be the target. And of course, you can have different targets and different distractors. It's, it's an easy task to, um, to do. So uh, we concentrate in this part of the delay period. And this is just some conditions that we have to make sure that the animal actually, uh, where the distractor changed, the target of the distractor changed, where the animal, we were sure that it was attending to that position. This is happening very fast, like a couple of seconds. So the animal really have to be attentive, and we only give them a certain time to make a attack. He cannot just take forever to make a attack. It has to be pretty quick. So we recorded the activity from, uh, from the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortical area AA with those arrays. So, um, and then basically, I'm going to show you how one of these neurons react. When the monkey is attending here, the neuron, uh, let me say, these are rasters, so this is time, and this is actual potentials in a single trial. Each row is a single trial. So uh, when you see a lot of concentrated in that, it means that the neuron was really active, <coughs> firing a lot. In this case, it wasn't. 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 It was. So this neuron was only active when the monkey was attending to the right and lower position on the screen. It wasn't active in another. And this is cover attention. The stimulus is exactly the same. So it's like a neuron that you have in your brain that is only active when you're covertly attending to that part of the visual field. That should be equivalent to it. So of course, I mean, we can actually find selectivity for uh, uh, different parts of the visual field. This is the different quadrants of the visual field in all these different neurons with different colors, and we can have a map. And indeed, now we can say that the prefrontal cortex seems to have some sort of a map of attention, of where the attended locations are. So which is actually very nice. Um, I think that this part, what, I, what we did was actually record neural activity for many neurons simultaneously, like 50 neurons. And then this neural activity, um, what we did is we input into a classifier. So during the attentional period, that is when we consider that the monkey is sustaining attention, we count for each trial the number of action potentials per second, and we input into a classifier. A classifier is, uh, um, in this case, we, should, we use a support vector machine decoder. So a support vector machine, I mean, many, many of you probably are familiar with logistic regression, right? It's almost like in a multidimensional space when you have a logistic regression model and you basically put a boundary in the middle of the logistic regression. So, and you say, well, it could be, uh, if, if my neural activity falls in this place, like on this side, it's category one. If it is on this side, it's category two. So it's a classifier. It's a statistical way to look at it. You can also think about 
little bit where it's not really exactly an ANOVA, but what you can think about it is that the means of neural activity in different states, we have four different states, are at different positions in this multidimensional <coughs> space. This multidimensional space, I, is there any physicists here? I find mm -hmm. this thing so abstract because they say that if you have a multidimensional space, you have many axes and all the axes are of thought. So how do you imagine that? I have problems imagining. I thought that was a hypermelon, but no, it was actually. But the, what I'm trying to say is that each of the axes of this space is a neuron, and the neuron gives you a profile of activity. And by looking blobs in this multidimensional space, what the classifier do, does is looking for those blobs. It's also used a lot in, in patients, actually classifying symptoms and things like that can be used uh, a lot too. Now, the first thing that we did, what I'm showing you here is actually the decoding accuracy of the classifier and reading the brain activity of the animal and telling us what the, um, what the animal was actually looking at. So uh, it did at 80% accuracy. Of course, in all this trial, the animal was right, but the classifier did actually almost 80% accuracy. So it means that if I can read the neural activity from an animal or from a human in this area, I can tell you with 80% accuracy where the person is attending to, which is without knowing anything else about that. So it, just by looking at the neural activity. Um, we did that. Now, the most surprising thing is when, when we look at the correlations, uh, the correlations, the way that we look at the correlations, we take the classifier and we train the classifier with neural activity that is actually recorded uh, the way that we record it with the correlated activity of the neurons there. Now, then we go and we shuffle all these trials and we destroy artificially the correlations. So we artificially de destroy the connections between neurons or the consequence of connectivity between neurons. And when we destroyed that, it got better, the classifier. It's almost like if the, the correlation is a treatment or is actually, actually an enhancer for, for attentional, uh, for, for that kind of activity. So when we decorrelate neural activity, the classifier did better. What that means is that if you take the neural activity from the prefrontal cortex and you decorrelate it by some artificial means, you're going to find uh, that your performance is going to get better. So, which is, uh, Many of you may consider as a flaw in design in the brain. I don't, know. I don't think that the brain was designed. I think that it just happened. Anyway, um, what we did was to run a randomized controlled trial because we had this uh, hypothesis that the neural activity that Madhul Fenidei would decorrelate neural activity. So, and what we did was we put uh, two animals in a schedule. We just get the second animal here. And what we did was to put different dosages. So, as you see, uh, these dosages that you see is milligram per kilogram. And we have in green were the, the sessions where the animal didn't get methylphenidate. It's like a small clinical trial. Um, um, and then uh, we did other sessions uh, with different doses of methylphenidate. Here we put a lower doses here than here. So we generated actually a randomized uh, schedule by the computer. And then we put the animals in those randomized schedules. The way that we did that, we took a syringe. We took um, a little, um, um, because we wanted to emulate patients as much as possible. Uh, we took a syringe with uh, jelly, yeah, and then we, they, they, they love the jelly, they love everything sweet. Um, and then uh, actually uh, we gave like half an hour before the session. We run this with Rida Jubur, I don't know if you actually uh, know him, he's at McGill. Rida is a psychiatrist at McGill, so and, um, uh, this methylphenidate, we did all the protocols and all the things. I wasn't from Cuba, I was actually <laughs> from, and uh, we passed all the ethics protocols at McGill and everything. So we monitored the sleep of the animal actually too, and the sleep of the animal was just fine. So these doses actually didn't uh, produce any insomnia or anything like that. Um, and here, what we do, the first thing that we do is that we look at the performance of the animal in this task. In this task, we can look at, for example, the proportion of uh, correct responses, which is in green, the proportion of errors, a cast of the distractor, fixation break, uh, no responses. So, uh, until here, the green one is the proportion of uh, correct responses. And then what we can see is for each trial, for each uh, doses of methylphenidate, how was uh, uh, the performance of the animal. And what you have here is the absolute change in performance actually from zero. And you have that there is an improvement. It's not very big. It's about three to 4% here. In that animal, you get an improvement of 6%. And the interesting thing here that it was 
practically at very low doses. When you increase the dose, this animal got worse, actually, which is something that you might see in clinical practice. And, uh, and that animal, when we increase the dose, it got a little worse, but not as worse as the other animal. Something that tells us that there is something idiosyncratic about how the, the way that this is happening. So we concentrated actually in these doses through the neural activity. We collected a huge, a huge amount of data. And the first thing that we saw that we look at is was this methylphenidate actually make the neurons more responsive or less responsive? And there is uh, some data from Amy Arnstead actually in, in, in Yale that. She has been looking, she has only one uh, paper published that I have seen, and she has like 11 neurons. And those 11 neurons, I think that about half of them, I think that they have an enhancement in response with uh, methylphenidate. And we didn't find that, actually. We didn't find an enhancement in response. What I'm showing here is the response when the animal is attending to the stimulus that is producing the neural response, and here where the animal is ignoring the stimulus. And there is a huge difference between the two. Right? So what that means is when the animal is the neuron that I show, when the animal is attending to that position, there is a huge, uh, a lot of, uh, the neuron is firing a lot, and when the animal is attending to this position, the neuron actually fires very little, but it's the same for methylphenidate and for control. And that is something that I, I, I kind of uh, think about that when you do an experiment in, in vitro, in a petri dish, or you do an experiment uh, in the whole system, is very different. It's very different because when you isolate a neuron in a slice and you start pumping a simulation of a neuron, you don't activate the whole network. And networks of neurons actually have a way to control the amount of activity that they produce. We call that normalization. So when you have a neuron, these neurons physically could give you a response of 500 actually spikes per second because the way that they're built, that the neuron, the ion channels, the things, so you can drive it and it could give you 500 spikes per second. But um, they don't fire 500 spikes per second when you see the animal in vivo. They fire 40 spikes per second, 30 spikes per second. And what happened is that I think that the brain, we have shown that and other groups too, has a way to normalize the activity so that the activity doesn't go too high. It kicks lateral inhibition and it keeps the neurons in a dynamic range that actually doesn't go too high and too low. So that was something that we found that methylphenidate didn't do that in our sample, and we have a lot of neurons. We have more than 1,000 neurons here. Um, however, when we look at the correlations between neurons, this is neuron one and neuron two, the correlated activity that I was telling you, we find that in this particular example, the activity was correlated, for example, in the control condition. But when you go to the methylphenidate condition, the correlation cloud becomes uh, instead of an ellipse, it goes just a, 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 a circle. So basically, it decorrelated the neurons in that specific, specific case. So we can say that in this case, what methylphenidate has done is actually decrease the correlation of the interactions between these two neurons in a way that they fire more independently. And it is a statistical property that you have more independent samples, then your sample size doesn't need to be that big to have an accurate estimate. Right? It's like excluding twins if, from a study or something like that, if you want to. Uh, now, when we look at the changes in, um, in correlation, actually, from zero, we have that, indeed, for all neurons, there was a decrease in positive and negative correlations. I don't want to get into that, but um, it was an increase in correlated activity in general. Um, and that happens in the two animals, in F, in Fred, and Jerry Lee. So they actually did pretty well. In that case, so what we can conclude here is that the methylphenidate produces a small but reliable increase in correlated activity. So it makes the brain, in this case, less noisy. That's what we found. The other good thing about doing these experiments in animals is that the animals didn't have any idea that they were taking methylphenidate or placebo. And I really doubt that they would actually be so aware. With patients, it's always tricky, and they're always making some of these uh, conspiracy theories, but uh, in this case, probably, I don't think that they were actually that, um, uh, it, it, that we have this confounder, so which was actually pretty good for us. So what I can conclude is actually that oral administration of FPA and methylphenidate improved the performance of my hack monkeys in tasks requiring attention. Given the similarity between the, the brain areas and the prefrontal cortical architecture, um, 
and I, if you want to look more into that, I will actually uh, recommend you. Uh, there is a, an article by Michael Petridis where he compares side by side prefrontal cortex in in, in monkeys and in humans, um, and these correlations actually uh, seems to be happening. It correlates activity without changes in overall neural activity. So it let the neurons fire in the same level that were firing before, but it decorrelates them. It's a pretty clever way. If you have synapses and you have neuromodulators, actually, and this neuromodulator could actually block synaptic transmission just like that, it doesn't need to be a plastic change. It doesn't need to be a change in synaptic strength or synaptic ways that is permanently encoded there. You can actually switch on and off a synapse, actually, very, very uh, nicely by doing these kind of things. Um, so uh, we believe that that's uh, maybe the, or at least one of the ways by which methylphenidate improves information coding in the brain in normal patients and patients with, uh, uh, I mean, in normal uh, subjects and in person in patients. Actually. Now, I'm going to end up with, I, I try to do that in Photoshop. Do tell me if that is uh, from your clinical experience. I really want your feedback here because I was trying to say, uh, what I'm trying to do here is trying to see how a visual scene is explored through common attention and eye movement. As you see, for example, when I showed this visual scene, probably what your brain was doing or my brain was doing is going from to the most interesting things, the people. The building is probably left out. It's the least that your attention went to, right? So I think that that would be something that, that I thought that your brain and ups with a picture like that. So the other items, uh, I mean, you perhaps don't even realize that they're there. So that has profound implication for witness uh, testimony and things like that, too, as you can imagine. And there is a, a book by a friend of mine and Tom Albright at the Salk Institute that uh, has a lot to do with that. Uh, now, how would a deficit of attention, that's right, with your help, <laughs> I don't know. It was just intuitively for me to do, would perceive that. So if you have a child with deficit of attention, most of the things that people report, actually, is that they can switch attention, but they don't stay long enough in one item. So if you don't stay long enough in one item, you cannot encode it. How can you that get into your sensory system, produce this stable firing, and how can you encode that, and how can you bring it into memories? It could be even getting worse. I mean, I got it pretty, pretty worse there. So, and, and that's something that I would like to, to be to us, perhaps a person that has ADHD, this is something that, that would be, an, and I would get your opinion on that. And of course, these are the guys that actually did um, the, whole, um, the whole work. So these are people in the lab, we're in this Chinese restaurant in Montreal. That, uh, but it was mainly the work of uh, Matthew Levitt and uh, Sebastian Tremblay. So that was, uh, well, thank you. That was uh, that was great. You know, actually, I saw you give this talk a few months ago. It was actually uh, pick up much more this time, which is mm -hmm. nice. So that, that, that's wonderful. We have, we have uh, which, which, not just about attention, but just sort of be able to, to go through it again. I think it was really helpful. Uh, any questions or comments from you? Yep. Um, great talk. I have a question. So, uh, uh, methylphenidate is supposed to act on dopaminergic or more adrenergic uh, neurotransmission. Are there other receptors in this part of the cortex? Do you think it acts directly there, or is that just the downstream effect of a different effect that is somewhere else in the brain? And that's the reason why I ask. I can tell you. Oh, I see. <laughs> no, no, there are receptors in that in that part of the brain. The neurons are not there, but there are receptors and terminals, projections to that part of the brain. So. Uh, I think that that's one of the things that I look into it. So if you look at the pulmonary receptor concentrations, and there is something about methylphenidate that I didn't say, that studies of methylphenidate, they say that at low doses, you have particularly higher concentrations in, in the prefrontal cortex relative to other, to other systems. And that may be one of the reasons why these low doses actually uh, give you the, the, the effect uh, on cognition but if you increase the dose, then you're going to get into, you know, motor systems, basal ganglia, control, things like that, and things may get pretty worse than what they are. Well, what is actually interesting, so I'm, as you know, look at sensory filtering pre-attentive, which is in the lower brain areas, and um, 
which is very much influenced by dopaminergic systems. And it has been shown that methylphenidate in low doses uh, enhances sensory filtering, which reduces the amount of sensory information going to the cortex, so it should reduce noise, whereas in higher doses it impairs sensory filtering. So, so that's really interesting point, because I was going to ask about that, and if it actually reduces the noise, and it's not auditory noise, it's just sort of background activity, but that's the case, if, if we know people with autism in particular, but probably many different uh, mental health problems, have difficulty sort of to dampening down sort of sensory inputs. So they get this sort of overwhelming sensory input. So if it dampens down sensory stuff, would stimulants actually then help with all the sensory problems that people with autism have? I worry a bit about making that statement given the stimulants are probably overutilized in some ways, but I think it's an interesting experiment to see whether or not that would help with some of the sensory problems that we see so often. So I, I think that the, the I mean, we have, I've been searching at VSS, v, uh, which is the Vision Science Society meeting, and there is a section that I consider almost myself a little bit responsible for growing that section on autism and vision and sensory processing in, in patients with autism. And we have been growing that. And there is a person in Montreal, I don't know if he has an Italian name, what is it? Um, Dr. Uh, Del Maestro. Say it. Dr. Del Maestro. No, it's not Del Maestro, right? You know. But, um, oh my gosh, I forget. Anyway, he has been looking at sensory deficit in children with autism. But what he finds is that when you test in pass, when you present only one stimulus, Rob is saying actually, um, they don't have much of a deficit. Actually, they, the deficit is when you have more than one stimuli. Exactly, and we have to look at sensory filtering. Sensory is, is filtering, exactly. And I think that what the prefrontal cortex is really doing, one of the, we have done several experiments on that, is like elaborating in this saliency map. And this saliency map, then what you do is project to other areas and you inhibit these structures. A, a lot of people have seen attention in sensory systems as a, as a system to enhance information, to, to multiply the amount of spikes. I think that what attention is basically doing is filtering out these structures. So it's literally a filter. Yeah, but there are pre-attentive filters already. So attention is the last um, yeah. filter, but that is, um, I think, I, I think attention is already disrupted in many of these uh, people because the pre-attentive filter already is not intact. So they get too much sensory information to the cortex. So it makes it difficult to actually focus on something as you sh uh, sh shown in your picture. Everything is there all the time. Yeah. So it's hard for them to focus on something because it, it's just too much noise. It's my view. Of you know, I, 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 I should, you know, you're right, but I should say what I'm talking about is voluntary attention, what we yeah. call top-down attention. Exactly. Top-down attention is certainly something that you cognitively actually direct. Now, it's an, I'm looking for a person with a red shirt, so I'm looking for that person. There is other kinds of attention that I didn't touch here, and I have no idea what methylphenidate does to it, that we use, I mean, psychologists, as you know, probably it's, it's a pop-out attention, or what is actually bottom-up attention, that, and I think that, I don't know if um, but Rob, correct me, or, or if you work with children with autism and ADHD, when you have a startled response or some kind of pop-out stimuli, actually they do direct attention to that. I mean, I, I do it. I guess it's probably pre-conscious stuff. Like yeah, that's really if possible. you repeat it again, if you do like what you say, repetition, suppression, all that kind of things, it does happen. But if it is a novel stimulus and it pops out, they go straight for it. I think yeah. that's something that... Uh, but what is interesting, uh, again, is that um, what you report, what you see with this top-down control attention, we see the same with a bottom-up sensory filtering, which is like a prerequisite for attention. We see the same dose response curve, so it, it does just, uh, enhance that bottom-up sensory filtering, but it uh, um, uh, imp impairs it when the dose is high. So it's kind of interesting. So it's the, the same effect. You know, like the bottom up process is then on the top down. But, but I think what would be really interesting to do in a clinical trial sometime with, with the sensory issues, we see where people with autism seem to be bombarded by stuff all the time, yeah. would be in, in addition to just like your attention and concentration, if parents fill out the, the brief sensory profile or whatever it's called, did, did those things actually make a difference to that um, as, uh, as well? Here's a question I had, Julio, and I think Jeff, you and, and Kramer have a better sense this, and I, but when we talk about attention, this looks at visual attention purely. That's right. But there are different kinds of attention I've seen with auditory attention, things like that. And with kids with ADHD, I think that the auditory attention is just as much of a problem as visual stuff is. Uh, I mean, do you think that it works in the same way, or do you have any 
So, so, so far, I mean, uh, what I didn't say that this area is multi-sensory. So this area receives a lot of input from the auditory cortex. And auditory- It's a visual task though. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but in the same area, there are people that they have done experiments actually in auditory attention, and they have found very similar things. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, uh, the problem is that 80% of the people are working on vision, or probably even more than that. And people not working on vision feel pretty bad about it, and everyone that starts ta talking about vision like, Oh, this is the main sense, is the sense that primates use for, and people get pretty mad. Andrew actually got mad at it from it because he worked in the somatosensory system. Uh, yeah, is, is, is this true? And I do have the impression with the somatosensory system that there is something special about autism. I don't know if anyone has done any clinical trial about that, but there is something special about texture and touch and things like that. I, I don't know, I mean, I talk about my personal experience and, and yeah, other people have talked. We did a T2 imaging study once we showed actually the greatest ever mammalian T2 it was in the sensory, so that's not a sensory cortex uh, as um, said. Well, Jeff, do you have any comments when you're a psychologist, I believe? Uh, any other questions or comments you'll have? So just um, as David, so we have, Right, so this, uh, we're yeah, and signed in, please yeah. do, especially if you're <laughs> so, so, we, so we have a pro for parents of the Royal College of Physicians here in Canada, too. Uh, okay, and CPA and UCAB. No, Royal College of Physicians. Okay. And just reach a little bit of the Yeah, So, so we're, we're working on the BCAB stuff? I can. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, so this was great. Julio. Thank you very much for that. So, so next month, uh, I'm going to present a case on a, a young man with uh, what's something called Gorlin syndrome, which I had never heard of previously, um, and uh, which also is which is caused by a gene that seems to be associated with autism, actually. So it's sort of a, a nice crossroad. So I'm going to present a clinical sort of presentation, and we're going to get somebody from Genex just to talk about what that gene does. And then in November, actually, Don Soklovsky, who is at Western and has been involved in the development of the, the WISC over many years, is going to come and talk about intelligence and, and sort of recent research on intelligence. So uh, next month, second Wednesday of the month, we hope to see everybody there. And thank you for, uh, for coming. Everybody, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>